So make sure that, make sure that the, the mic give you a copy of that. And so just to start, Lauren, would you mind to repeat your question? So for the record, for the record. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm a patient who is three months post-op L45 OLIF, um, and she is now having further SI joint symptoms after doing very well the first couple of months post-op. Um, my question was how how what percentage of patients have an SI joint fusion or an OLIF after the other surgery? Yeah. And the answer to that, uh, first of all, that is a, this is a very relevant question and it's going to become even more relevant in the next two, three years. You are going to start dealing with lots of sacroiliac uh, problem because the awareness of the disease and the treatment is increasing in my part of the world, meaning in the spine. Are you guys able to see that the sacroiliac joint uh, presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's start with... Yep. Um, there are lots of things here. I'm just going to show you a selected part of it. And that selected part, let's start with history. He did sacroiliac fusion and sacroiliac treatment in the surgical, on the surgical side long before we did the lumbar spine treatment. It was well known, in, even in the last century and the, the century before that, that that can be a source of pain. The, problem is this with the sacroiliac joint, it's very complex. And as a matter of fact, um, we call sacroiliac joint a joint is not a joint. It should be called a synostosis. I'll come back to that. It is stabilized with ligaments. Practically, our entire weight is hanging on the sacroiliac joint with some ligaments that um, hold us. We are suspended. Our torso is suspended sacrum is suspended to pelvis with these ligaments. And you can imagine that, you know, day in, day out over the years, that can be very demanding. The reason that this is a very uh, uh, strong ligamental structure, there is the same reason that the sacroiliac fusion didn't work in the open old fashioned way. Because in the old surgery, I come back to that, we have to cut all this from the back cut all these ligaments to just get in. It caused more damage to get in. Recent studies show if somebody comes to you with a very pristine lumbar pain, 22% of that is not spine, it's sacroiliac joint. And if somebody had, that is the answer to your question. If somebody has sacroiliac disease, if somebody had a lumbar fusion, 43%, almost half of them are sacroiliac joint problem, not spine problem. About one half to two thirds of my failed back syndrome, meaning people I do spine surgery and then they still don't get better, is not spine anymore, it's sacroiliac joint. And this, that, that there's significant amount of data regarding that, that what those things are. Um, we get back to that, but um, this is the breakthrough, uh, uh, the uh, breakdown of what those percentages are based on significant number of data. And you see that sacroiliac joint is significant there. Okay. Um, let's talk about um, my experience with that. Many times I did this surgery 10 years ago, and these people would come back and I looked at the spine it was nothing wrong with the spine. And I this naturally, I would declare them as sacro, as failed back syndrome, whereas problem was not back or spine at all. And here is the ligament that we talked about that uh, I, I used to use that mostly when I was doing uh, scoliosis surgery, I would cut all these ligaments just to get access to the sac to, um, sacroiliac joint and to iliac crest to put additional screw there. So I totally understand we, why we abandoned from 1930s to 2000 almost for 70 years treatment of sacroiliac joint because solution sometimes was worse than the disease. And um, we know that sacroiliac joint has very little motion 
which is about less than four degree. Only time physiologically it moves is during the birth process. Even then, some enzyme have to come in and loosen those ligaments. Then it have like an open book kind of function. It opens up for pelvic or aperture to open up for the baby to have more space to pass through. For that reason, the rate of sacroiliac disease after pregnancy for a few years, it's much higher, up to four times higher than the regular population. For that reason, sacroiliac disease is more prevalent in female than male. So all of that makes sense. And excessive motion is patholo pathologic. Now, a question for you, Cole, name me a single muscle that goes across the sacroiliac joint and attaches to both sides of the sacroiliac joint. Uh, there you know, isn't one. There isn't one, that's right. There are muscles that pass from lumbar to the, uh, they pass over the sacroiliac joint and act like, you know, like iliopsoas come from lumbar region, obviously goes to um, the act on the femur and so on, but there is not a single muscle that act on that joint. So this is not a joint. And uh, so certainly for a long time, we had truly difficulty to understand. Every time patient had radiculopathy, we would say that's impossible. Why would sacroiliac joint cause radiculopathy? But this picture put in place our understanding. A, a inflamed joint can inflame, especially L5S1, but as well L4 nerve root, as you see, and cause radiculopathy that is uh, very, uh, um, uh, compatible with sacroiliac joint. Sacroiliac joint has two parts. As you see, we call this a uh, ligamental and articular part. And the inflammation can affect either or both part of it. They look in a real person like that. And you know, if you have done any anatomy course ever, uh, this is not how a joint supposed to look like. It's not like if you look at them, I was in a, 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 a hip surgery. When you take the head of the femur out, you will marvel how smooth, how cartilaginous it is, and how smooth it moves in the socket. This is not a joint. I'm just going to bypass few of these things because how to understand it in the anatomy, in the x-ray is not relevant to what you do, but this, is what you need to know. I'm just going to bypass that. So you see one, this is what you need to see. Pain in the leg, even in the L4 and L3 can be very compatible with the sacroiliac joint. And it makes sense that um, sacroiliac joint is now considered the adjacent segment to L5S1, especially if you do lower lumbar fusion. At least initially, sacroiliac joint is going to be picking up more um, mechanical stress and it can complain more. It can temporarily uh, get worse. And that is as well add to value of what you guys do to concentrate on the uh, uh, morphology and the, the posture and the action along the gluteal region, iliopsoas, to give the patient a better um, kind of um, statistical, statistically improve their chance to have less sacroiliac problem by concentrating on the iliopsoas, gluteal muscle, paraspinal muscle, and uh, make sure that they don't do too much bending and twisting, which as we know, especially act on the sacroiliac joint. As a matter of fact, if you need to know, here it is. This is how ah. we diagnose the sacroiliac joint. We twist it, we try to, it's very hard joint to twist because it's, as we talked about, there are significant severe ligament there. You have to use the femur as a fulcrum to put all these kind of tests to, and as you understand here, what we try to do, we try to use the femur to put more stress on the sacroiliac joint in, uh, in twisting motion, in open book motion, and compression to provoke it. These are so-called provocation tests. I have 
posters and so on. If you guys are interested, you can do that. You guys can do that. My part would be injecting it and practically uh, numb it up to see if I numb it up, pain goes away. When I'm there as well, I put some steroid and I had today, I had three patients where I injected it and I numbed it up, but obviously that lasts only a day or two max. Same thing that the dentist put in your gum. It won't last next day, but sacroiliac joint is not as well perfused as the gum or your mouth. So it lasts longer, sometimes up to day two or three, but not, nothing more than that. But as well, I put steroid in. I had three patients today that after multiple injection, they come there, the pain is one and two. I'm not going to do surgery for them. They are for all practical purpose are getting better without the surgery, just with that. But I officially call it diagnostic injection, but by adding steroid, I make it diagnostic and therapeutic injection. So this is going, this is the neglected child of the musculoskeletal system. So it's going to become more relevant to your practice and my practice. Okay. This is the diagnostic on your side. The treatment is very close to the lumbar spine, but you pay more attention to as well to um, proximal uh, lower extremity, like quadriceps to posture to gait and so on. These are, you emphasize that probably a little more. Cole, do you wanna, uh, or any of you, you wanna comment a little about what else we can do to reduce the stress on sacroiliac joint, especially the twisting action. You guys wanna comment on that? Um, I guess I, what I try to do is I just try to reteach and try to um, educate on just proper mechanics, proper mm -hmm. lifting, proper lunging, those kinds of things, reducing stress. Some individuals, they'll tolerate a squat fine. Other people need to do like set a modified golfer's lift on one side and a modified lunge or something like that. It really depends on the patient, but try to find a functional motion, whether it's just a true hip hinge or squat or something like that, that um, it works for them um, and they can do it with minimal to, to no in increase in their pain is what I guess I try to do as well as yeah. focus on soft tissue and focus on strengthening as I can. Yeah, Lauren, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with Cole. We focus a lot on function. Yeah. Um, but core stability, um, I did actually have Tracy try a, um, SI joint belt today, just to see if we can create more stability with that, um, that I've done a handful of that in the past. So another option when exercises aren't creating that stability. Um, obviously for lumbar spine braces are proven to be helpful for sacroiliac joint and even for 5S1. Is, has been shown to be helpful if you stabilize one of the legs, but that patient don't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. Sacroiliac joint belt and bracing has not been really shown to be um, very successful. Mm -hmm. you, you remember I told you that we start doing sacroiliac fusion before lumbar spine in 1930s and so on, and the solution was worse than disease. And I did it, do you remember I told you for 70 years we neglected that? Because mm -hmm. we didn't have a good solution for sacroiliac joint, we stopped doing research on that. We just don't know. Yep. Now it's time, you know. We can get together, come up with something, and run a test. We can publish paper about it because this is the neglected child. We just don't know. We, it's time for us to know more because now we have a good solution. We start understanding the diagnostic better. I'm, the truth of the matter is that this is a field ready for us to get involved and do better. And for, for 70 years, we neglected that. And that makes your question even more relevant, Lauren, because we just don't know. Mm -hmm. Surgical solution here, it was worse than disease. Okay? Mm -hmm. Go from the medial to lateral, take the material out, destabilize the spine, and then the patient used to much worse. First, we started with this triangular the plugs to be really successful. And now we have gone to the screw system. And now 
you may know that we just got FDA approval for our system. Now we can do that hopefully in the next uh, year or two with our Trident system. I'm going to show you a picture of that. I come back to that, but we can do that surgery in 15 minutes. As a matter of fact, 13 minutes surgery. What used to be a seven hour surgery and a gallon of blood loss, we can fix it in 15 minutes. This is the major improvement that we showed that people who get the surgery, look at that, they improve and to a point that everybody in the control group had to be converted to the surgery. This has been a success story for musculoskeletal and these numbers are going to skyrocket. So I'm going to bypass that and show you our Trident system where practically, but just one incision in one inch incision in the lateral thigh or hip area and going one screw and then the trajectory is fixed. So this is the end result. This surgery is in every time we did it is about 13 to 15 minutes. And the result of this surgery has been much better than spine surgery. But finally, you know, uh, we have a way of treating that. And uh, we just published a paper about it. It's online. Um, and I think we are on something very important here. It is 6.30. Let's just uh, uh, you know, come back to your patient, I think. This is what we are going to do for your patient. First of all, it is nothing unusual. 43% of the people have it. Thanks God, many times it's temporarily, meaning that we fuse the lower lumbar spine, they get worse. And now you know what to look for, meaning that provocation test, I can give you a brochure or something to look into those tests. You can do those tests. Yes, we, we're, we, we do those and complete those um, quite Excellent. frequently. And then on top of that, you know, the, the continue your physical therapy. The real answer to that is we don't know if there are specific things besides what's good for lumbar spine that would be helpful or not. It's time for us to know that. And, the, the, and, and, the, and the, to conclude that is that if with your physical therapy, she doesn't get better, I will inject it. That can be as well therapeutic. We don't know if you're doing it concurrently or in sequence is better or not. We don't just don't know. There's no data out there. And uh, the, on, to on top of that, if everything fails, this surgery has been shown based on significant amount of data to be a good surgery. Nowhere close to lumbar fusion. So Andrew, do you have any uh, comment or question for us? No, I think that's, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, actually, the question and the response in education. Um, I, I'm a physical therapist and manager in the Marshall, Minnesota area. Um, we've had some different spine surgeons in and out uh, over time. So I've been meaning to call into one of these and kind of get a feel for what, uh, what goes on in your practice too. So yeah, no, there are a less than probably 15 to 20% of spine surgeons are even uh, trained to, uh, to diagnose the sacroiliac joint. So mm -hmm. I see that very often that they go to a spine surgeon and they get sent out, go away, nothing wrong with your spine. They are true, they are right. Nothing is wrong with the spine, just the problem is not the spine, that's all. So I thought I heard you talk some about doing it as a secondary procedure. Um, do you, how often do you do it as a, that's, that's the procedure of first choice when they come in and uh, how do you that tease that out? We spine surgeon get to know that because we have failed back syndrome and we investigated. Um, you saw that 43% of the patient that uh, have sacral, um, have spinal fusion, have sacroiliac disease. Now, once uh, I got really good at diagnosing it, I would as well initially investigate it. Mm -hmm. Now I see that um, 
that really correspond to my diagnostic as well that about uh, at least one fifth to one fourth of the people that are coming to me with back pain, the problem is at least partially sacroiliac joint. Now, this is one of those things like that movie, Field of Dream. If you build it, they will come. If you don't look for it, you don't see it anywhere. But if you start looking for it, it's everywhere. Uh -huh. So that is why I think in the next two, three years, the numbers are going to skyrocket. And you will be one of the first step because if they come to us and they don't have anything that in the spine we can directly treat, we are going to send it automatically to you. Contrary to me that I send them to you independent of if they need surgery or not. Many of my colleagues, they will send it to you only if they don't see anything they can fix surgically. So meaning that Percentually, you will see more of them than I even. Yeah, or a failed injection therapy. They have, they have failed other things, then they are sent to you. So you put it as I have done, make it part of your the diagnostic and part of your investigation. So a few things are important in the history. Recent birth, giving birth, younger female, Especially they tell me in the night when they turn from side to side, especially recent, even minor trauma, like, you know, jumping from trampoline or something like that, okay? Obviously history of previous spine surgery. In the exam, just ask them, show you where the pain is. As a matter of fact, if they put the finger on it, I ask them, put your finger on it and they put the hand and turn around and say, no, no. Put your thumb on it. If they twice put the thumb on the same location within one and a half inch, already that's a 14 test. Okay, that's the easy part. And the provocation test, there's a modified test that I do. I can show it to you in person later on. And so put it part of your investigation and you'll see that it's more common than you even imagine. Thank you for answering that question, Dr. Abbasi. Okay, I think it is, uh, we should conclude it here if you don't have any other question. We should conclude it on a, a good note, mostly because I have two more hours of dictation. No, that is, that's just fine. Thank you, Dr. Bazi. I'm gonna kind of archive my question for next time. Um, Sounds good. If it's related to this, we can answer it now. Not necessarily. It, it kind of yeah. does have to do with some kind of regional interdependence and, or on, on a why you would work someplace else instead of the other, but uh, yeah. I think you a good question for next time. So let's keep some good question for the next time, okay? <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you guys, okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you.